hub um, for um, welcoming Professor Li Xiao Yun um, to the LSE. Huan Yi, we're always happy to have you back here. Um, I've known Professor Li for some time now, or more than a decade, I guess. Uh, yeah, almost 20 years, I guess. yeah, yeah. And um, he's a really important figure in the evolving development of the study of development in China. I mean, a lot of a lot of you as students or as researchers, you know, are looking at China and what what its own development experience has been. But it, it, it's quite amazing that the kind of enterprise of interdisciplinary development studies is really only about 20 years old or so. And this is the guy who's promoted it. Um, and it's had far reaching effects in China. Um, I won't go into your long CV. Uh, he is a founding dean of the School of Development Studies at the China Agricultural University. He has quite a list of degrees. He studied in Germany. Uh, Xiao Yun, Professor Li has uh, extensive experience doing research in China. Uh, and I mean, in Africa, as well as in China. Uh, and so his history goes back, particularly in Tanzania, quite a long time. He knows the, he knows those who have been attempting to pursue uh, a kind of catch-up development in Tanzania. But over the last 10 years or so, um, Professor Lee's been deeply involved in what is known as the, the Rural Revitalization Program in China, in work in the rural villages of Yunnan. And I visited some time ago one of those projects at its very early stage. Um, this work has been leading him to rethink a lot of what we have to say about development. And particularly when we think about rural development, to see what, what a lot of us have come to understand even by re-looking at our own histories here, that the processes of industrialization and rural development and agricultural development Historically, they have really been simultaneous rather than sequential. And in China, this is um, a, an observation, one of the many that Professor Li is coming up with in his new work. But I'm not going to tell people what you're saying and instead allow you to tell them. Thank you. hao to everybody. You know, this is a good moment, auspicious moment for a sentence. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, James. Uh, it's my great pleasure to be back at uh, the school and also uh, thank Dr. Professor Mun uh, for organizing this for me and also for the for LC through that public, global public policy public policy hub, if I understand correctly. And uh, and also uh, I'd like to take this opportunity to uh, to wish you all the best uh, for Chinese New Year. And uh, I'm extremely grateful uh, after quite some time, three, four years, uh, back to this uh, discussion uh, with the uh, students, with the professors, and also thanks for Gu Jing for coming from RDS and a senior research fellow from RDS and others. I uh, no name I don't know. And also the even I'm very grateful for the my student uh, invite his parents, father and mother here. And I feel extremely uh, grateful for that. And also my student, my assistant uh, here. And uh, today, uh, you know, I really like to <clears throat> I really like to offer you uh, some of my reflections uh, from what I have been working um, mainly over the last four or five years in China. Uh, those reflections, I would see, James, I would see those reflections. I'm not going to see deep reflection, but I see the, the reflections, uh, these this reflections join, uh, can join the, uh, uh, the long-standing debate. Uh, long-standing debate uh, for development uh, in our field of 
Bible studies. And I hope, <clears throat> I hope, uh, and I would, uh, uh, I would really come to the point that uh, uh, let us look at what I, you know, I didn't really, I didn't really want to have a very big world, a big world in terms of my, uh, my groundwork. And uh, mm -hmm. but I'm, I did, I did try to, uh, to look at the implications, uh, which I would consider uh, when people talk about China and over the last 30 years, and I have been part of this story, uh, this part of this narrative, and with Professor Gu Jing. So when we started talking about China and the West, and we talked about um, rising power, and I uh, was uh, very grateful uh, to, be, to have been served as the member of the advisory group for the uh, for the ERC, ESRC program, Rising Powers program. In that program, uh, that program is a part of the global movement. And this global movement in the beginning of the century looked east. And uh, looked east in the sense of, uh, in the sense of uh, uh, searching alternative, searching an alternative approach for development. In the, in the sense of our understanding from our field of inquiry, academic inquiry, it means that we are talking about something for developing countries. And I'm very happy, uh, quite a number of students in this room coming from that community, uh, China, uh, India, Southeast India, many countries. So, and uh, from, from, from that history, we say that from looking for the East, but, but the focus, uh, for that angle called East Angle, Angle of the East, uh, very largely uh, fall into the scope of uh, mm, uh, your Eurocentricity based uh, framework, uh, looking for the uh, rural urban transformation and mobile, labor mobility, uh, looking for industrialization. And uh, industrialization, we're looking for good governance, uh, looking for the poverty reduction. And which uh, James, uh, James lecture covers all these things over the last 46 years, you know. These are the ways and, uh, and the global focus uh, also started to, uh, to, to follow that paradigm to observe and to dig, to explore and to dig out called elements of China's experiences. So that was something which, uh, which what I called a narrative is the narrative of China's experiences in terms of poverty reduction, and and the people still people still still people still perceive that that experiences in the sense of awesome dog understanding. That means that you have to do this. You have to do this. Otherwise, you know, you have to follow this. You know, so so that is one thing. That's the background. So today I'm going to look at first. The comparative, uh, comparatively and historically, uh, and by by using my own case in the field of rural development. You know, now when we talk about the rural development, that people today is not people interested. Not many people are interested in rural development. So I use that as a case, and to 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 try to offer uh, what I call my observation, uh, which. I hope this observation and this reflection would lead to further discussion. Uh, further discussion, which I used to, something which I questioned, called new developmentalism. Uh, new developmentalism, because I personally, uh, as James, and uh, I'm a developmentalist person. I believe uh, I travel to India quite often, and I, I have India student. For PhD, I have students from Pakistan, from Africa, you know, and uh, I we, we got a lot of uh, common language uh, because we need develop. So we need something which you know. Uh, of course, we have we need different different type of development. So that is background I like to uh, say. But now, let me start. Uh, let me just start. I like to if you allow me to. No, no, I don't want to stay. I don't ask you here. Do you want, no, I need to put uh, yeah, yeah, your yeah, slides. Yeah, 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 thank you very much, yeah. <laughs> Good. Oh, yes, we have to share. Okay, sorry, yeah. <clears throat>
Yeah. Yeah. This one, right? I'm I'm happy. I'm happy. Yeah, I'm happy Xi Jinping and others put my drawing. Uh, I'm good architect. I'm good uh, artist, you know, and I can draw myself. I'm also good ar architecture. And uh, this is, uh, and uh, uh, I like to, I like to start with, uh, uh, with, uh, with what I call the awesome dog model of uh, rural transformation, uh, which I call the sequential model. Uh, I take here uh, two cases. Uh, one case, and I got early develop model, England. Uh, you all in UK, you all, some of maybe you are British, and uh, if you look at the history in the field of rural development and the transformation, great transformation, then you understand. I'm not going to elaborate more. And uh, for the case of England, uh, there are three things I like to highlight. Number one, and the UK's transformation is the first one in the world, and the one that we all follow even today, looking for Asia, looking for the Africa. And, and, but the UK is the case that agricultural revolution start first. And agricultural revolution produced the surplus. And that surplus is the uh, driving force for industrialization. So that is first, uh, you have to say, uh, looking for the, uh, looking for the, let me see, yeah, good. Looking for this and uh, greatly agriculture, but the agriculture, you know, agricultural uh, revolution includes two things. So now why is the land inclusion? Land inclusion, of course, today, if we take land, land inclusion, and we, we have to take a very critical view on that. But the land inclusion uh, created opportunity for, for agricultural economy scale of effect. That means the large, middle and the large size of farmers increase. So this is one area. And the second one is for the technological improvement. And that means that for the crop and the crop and the forage rotation started. And everybody knows that in UK, uh, you have this turnip, you plant turnip, and you plant turnip time by time, and the soil fertility is re reduced, and the yield is reduced. So you grow barley, other things like this, and then, and then started grow, uh, start to grow clover. And uh, it's it's the it's the uh, it's clover, and uh, now you have the clover and the crops, means the crop and the forage crop and the forage rotation system, which improved hugely for the, for the soil fertility and also for the crop production as well, for the uh, livestock production. So this is, these things, you know, and already started in 17th century, end of 17th century, middle of 17th century, so agricultural revolution. And the second one, I'll say the agricultural revolution uh, and uh, induce the change of structure of economy. So that is first one, the second one. So looking for, but I like to draw your attention uh, the one that uh, those process when I'm talking about quickly lasted almost 200 years, almost 200 years. So looking for the data, transformation data and the uh, end up of the 19th century and the 20th, beginning of 20th century and both share of agricultural GDP and the share of labor force, agricultural labor force, two indicators, and the dropped already down to the 10% in the beginning of 20th century. This means start from 18th century to the 20th century, the 200 years, the UK realized completely so-called today, we are all pursuing ourselves called modernization. So this is something, but one thing we need to keep in mind that looking for this, Go up here. So for all agriculture output improvement over almost, almost 150 years or 200 years, farmers' income had not been increased, had, had not been improved for over 150 years. And James told me that banking capitalist thing in the examination, so I would go to say, but I added a little bit before the Seminar. I said, looking how the 
hold UK farmers and the low, low, uh, lower class people in the society sacrificed for 100 to 150 years to contribute to the capitalist development in this country. So this is a very, very heavy, this is very heavy political social uh, consequences that uh, uh, we have to bear in mind, you know? And we can't see those, st those days, but if anybody read about novels like, like Dickens, uh, Oliver Twist, you might have read this one, and look at the whole miserable of the people moving from the rural area to the urban area. Those, and this is the situation, you know, and this is the way that people take uh, very, very critically, and also Karl Marx himself criticized uh, capitalism. So this one case I like to elaborate. Sorry. Uh, no, sorry. I can't believe. Yeah. Uh, oh, sorry. Second one, I look for Japan. <coughs> very similar. And Japan is very similar. I saw the, uh, in the case of Japan, it's like awesome dog are like the model. And, uh, and it's very, a little bit, you know, in, in the complete, in the almost very similar, very similar. And the Japan's case is like uh, uh, when they started agriculture uh, revolution. They start agricultural revolution at the same time for industrialization. It's different from, a little bit different from UK way to fall. And Japan started. So Japan stand between China and the UK. This is what I say, between China and the UK in terms of the model and expenses. This is the, and the, and the Japan. And the second one, Japan in the good in the good way is that agriculture the capital surplus generated in the agriculture sector and had been used for immediately for rural in the rural industrialization the people rural the light industry and for people out you know see the transformation and this transformation but the same the Japan suffered Japan suffered uh, very similar very similar as what the UK earlier. Only, only issue is that the time is quite condensed. It's time quite pressed. It's not longer and it's, it's shorter than what India, what England did. So these two. And uh, very quickly, I like to reflect uh, those two from those two cases, and that uh, agricultural revolution, agricultural revolution, and. Uh, Provide this, you know, provide the material, everything. This is very conventional. This very conventional Austin dog approach, and we all talk about today, still talk about today. And uh, an impact of agricultural revolution, food poverty has been lacked. It's both India, uh, both uh, England and, uh, and Japan, both. And uh, mm, so that is the, what I said, that is India and the Japan, this lagged almost like half half 50 years, half century, and the UK is 150 to 20 years. And that's, that is the political, what I call the political and the social consequence of this sequential agriculture, urban, industry, and the back agriculture again. So if you take this country, go travel to the countryside of England, big land, you know, travel to the UK, uh, Japan countries and no people, you know, and all concentrated in the big city like Tokyo, like Tokyo, killed the big cities. And this is very different, very different. So, and the one thing I also like to draw your attention, and my student asked me, Professor Lee, look, and, uh, and when, the, when you talk about this UK and nobody's farming, uh, you mean the beginning of 20th century, uh, and I, I once asked a friend of mine who retired, very retired senior person in the UK, but Gordon Covey, and, uh, and he's very famous. And he, I asked him, I said, can you remember in your age when you were young and who was farming in this country? He said, oh, my father was farming. I said, where your father there? And he said, my father is East African in Kenya. You understand what I mean here? So this means that and the UK had a great opportunity to colonize, to colonize in where? In West Indies, to collect, to harvest the what? Harvest the sugar cane, you know, produce the sugar, brown sugar from those area, very cheap to the to the to the country, and uh, and do not need further sugar beet to produce more 
expensive sugar any longer. And of course, India had a long colonial history in, in India, Bengal, and all these areas where they get all this rice, you know, long rice from India. So these are cheaper. So colonial, colonial colonization helped uh, UK, also part of Japan, you know, and uh, Japan also had, you know, to, to, to provide this much, to provide these things uh, to, 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 to be used to compensate, to compensate the gap uh, when they had in terms of supply. So we, today, you know, this cannot be, you know, this cannot be replicated by any developing country today, like China. And when we, Jingu, you should, we should remember, even 10 years, 15 years ago, when we start our program here, and James, you know, that's a big topic of land grabbing. Land grabbing China in Africa, you remember? So the mean that, and those guys today, like James and all these guys in UK, and they set up a set ethics. Ethics means, so, uh, you know, ethics means political correctness, and, uh, and mean that you cannot do colonization, you can't do it because it's wrong. And they have already, you know, and they, they accumulated so much money to build these huge buildings here. And they said, no, you stop, no, you can't do it. When China was in Africa for agriculture, and all students here, and all students here in ASE, they're all interested, write about China in Africa. So the narrative of China African war mean, mean China, you should not do like this, you should not be very careful, land grabbing. So we, we can't do anything like this. You know, this is mean, this is a very different situation now for the agriculture, for the rural development, for the transformation. Okay. So now I start. Let me start to talk about a little bit historical. Uh, process of China's uh, urban rural transformation. I'm talking about the rural development here, but actually I'm talking really develop, you know. And uh, first, I look at the uh, uh, 19th century, middle 19th century. It's huge. All the Chinese people, you all understand the Nanjing Tiaoyue, uh, Nanjing Treaty. Nanjing Tiaoyue. So Nanjing Treaty is the, is the, the, it's the uh, uh, it's the time when the British opened the China, okay, and so we start Chinese people. So we, our civilization, our great great long civilization, stopped, uh, not completely stopped, not completely, but but interrupted, interrupted by the British, uh, by mm. the British uh, that uh, we are because we failed to defeat. The, British in the first opium war, and uh, and our door open, and um, in the first four the four cities, uh, four cities, first four cities. I I show you here here the four cities here, and all cities, and uh, when they open our poor cities, and uh, mm, and uh, and all business people coming and uh, you know and the cheap things, uh, textiles, everything you know, uh, uh, dumped in China. Xinxiao, dumped in China, and uh, uh, which created uh, the isolated, uh, um, isolated, uh, uh, self-contained uh, natural system, Jingji, is isolated Jingji, around the most fertile and 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 developed regions, southern part of China. So that means like Zhejiang, Jiangsu. This is this is the way. And that destroyed our textile and handmade textile sector and everything. So this is very similar. This is very similar like British with India. And India, India is highly similar. So this is something. And also secondly, and, and the cities developed, started in China. So real, real modern capitalist city started. Shanghai, Shanghai, and Ningbo, Guangzhou, and all these cities start really, really urban development started. And, uh, and because all these foreigners coming, they need what? They need servant, they need the carriers, they need all these people, they pay for these people, they increase the banking services, and they all, and the people coming from rural countryside. You know, the problem is that our rural area, our agriculture had never been improved. We didn't have an agricultural revolution. 没有, 我们没有农业革命, 
Therefore, so you have this problem, you know, agriculture is backward and agriculture has not been developed, has not been developed like what UK did and Japan. And then you had also immediate open that people get. You see the, you see the problem. This is called the first wave of rural decline. Deep border, deep border, travel. So that is a big problem. So that is the first. Second stage, a drop into 1949 to 1978. So China, Republic, People's Republic of China started, okay, very important. Now, China formally started agricultural improvement, very similar, like land reform, which James of fan for Chinese land reform. So we have polished the land road system, everybody got the land. And uh, secondly, we start for the new varieties, for the, for the irrigation, and, uh, and all these uh, you know, technological development, universities and the training farms, everything. So this, this, called, this provide a um, huge drive for the, for the agricultural Green production, you know, from 1950s, from 1950s, first 10 years, increased increase dramatically. And, uh, but at the same time, China also started urbanization, uh, started industrialization, very different from Japan. And the China started industrialization, not, not, not begin with uh, light industry, because the light industry absorbed labor. But China started with the heavy industry. But the heavy industry absorb money, capital, but exclude labor. So the rural people had to stay in the rural area, and the money drove out of the rural area. And the money dropped rural area put into the heavy industry. Okay. So my student father is an economist, and he's sitting there. He he probably his person correct me if I'm wrong. And, and look at this, and this create what I call, this create dual, dual economy. And look at data, rural population. Rural population remains increasingly, like almost 800 million, 800 million, 80%. 80% of our population live in the rural area before 1978. But the money, all the money went out. So this is called the second, this distorted structure, second wave of rural decline was so poor because you have so many people working in the field and the poverty and everything. And the, Therefore, we call the poverty impact of agricultural growth was offset by the ill-structured agriculture and industry development. So this is the, this is the second I'm going to see. Quickly. And then from 78 to 2012, and I call this called awesome dog model alike transformation. So China start Trying back again to the Japanese model, more or less. Means start agriculture again, and also not doing industrialization in the heavy industry, but in the light industry. And in the light industry, not in the urban area, but in the rural area, called the rural industrialization. And that way, when money, money goes to the money, Accumulated, accumulated, looking for uh, first seven years, uh, agriculture grow at 7%. And the 7% in agriculture growth and the highest in the country's history, uh, which produce what? Produce the surplus. And I was the person who explained that. I joined university in 1978. 
as a 15 years old boy. I understand that very correctly, very, very clearly. I remember very clearly. And, and, and that money going to the rural township and the rural enterprises, and, and those, those fa farmers move out to the, from agriculture to the rural township uh, enterprises. So that was called the orphan dog model of life. Now you, 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 you got the virtual circle, not vicious circle. You got the virtual circle of, of capital flow and the labor flow. Okay? <clears throat> but that is good. But countryside has, has not been invested. And the people draw out education. So education system put all the farmers, put all the people going to cities, like many people, like a professor Sinero, you know, they're all countryside people, all out. They got the brain drain, you know, brain drain from countryside to the urban air. That's a capitalist approach. This is pure typical capitalist approach. And also the also the also money and generating the agriculture run. So rural area put into what? Put into what I call the third wave of rural decline. So over the last hundred, more than 150 years, and the China experienced three times of three times of rural decline with a, with a globalization within the context of globalization. So I'm not going to see external factor contributed to today's problem in China, but I would see clearly, yeah. And lastly, looking for what I call alternative, sorry. Yeah. <coughs> lastly, I would call this alternative model. So I think you put, put yeah. Oh, no, quickly, yeah. I'm sorry, Paul. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so lastly, I would call the looking for this new challenge today. I'm not going to retreat. Like the we have agriculture, we still have a big population, and that implication globally same. We have so many people still working in agriculture in the rural area. We cannot pull all these people in the city, and and also the uh, uh, and we cannot go. The, the big city cannot grow longer, and the growth rate of big cities declined. We cannot expect big city grow to put all these people in the city. No, it's not possible. And 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 increase the cost for the, for the urban uh, development to accommodate people coming. You know, this is very a lot of agriculture aging problems. There are many many challenges. You know, challenge. so we have to see today. Looking at all this my village, what I did myself. This is all our village I'm building in China. So checking the internet, you see all my work, and you see the opportunity. Today is I'm going to, I'm going to emphasize today's very different situation. First one, with the rural urban transformation, that value of the rural area increased. Uh, rural area is no longer the place that people ignore, but play, the the rural area is the area where people like to go back now because they feel the values, they feel the interest. And this is very different from uh, UK, uh, UK this time and also Japan. And no, people are going just completely. Now this also with the land, land tenure issue, big land there, and they're private, the funds, you cannot go there doing anything. You can't do it like this, you know, this land tenure. So you see, and also I see also India or many countries and, uh, and also for the opportunity like, um, and the people like doing this, uh, you know, uh, 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 available for this uh, land and other resources, and even for the technology today. You see how uh, this uh, internet technology and uh, digitalization, digital technology how can reduce tremendously the problems which we've been working uh, to overcome the cost for the market cost everything so that the people and the, and the farmer can can use this uh, you know can use this reduce the access market everything so today's situation is very different that uh, 
which I'm going to argue. Uh, I'm going to argue this to the village. I'm going to work. And the new development model, I'm going to say, uh, that it's number one, that we can create a new economic structure in the rural area. And that is something which is different, different from that way. We just left the agriculture for, for the base for surpluses, for the base for services. No, no, no. Ag rural area is the, a very active area where we should use as a new economy. So looking for the, the smart agriculture, digital farms, all oh, everything. So we've been working ourselves and creating new rural econ economics, the integration first, the second, uh, and even the service sector. These are the very different scenario, looking for the exercise practice in China. And uh, also, and we have to change, we can change those poor farmers, you know, uh, no longer put this farm back to the, uh, go to the urban area, but to, to really, really turn that into a new farm. You know, they're really modern farm, modern small farm. Those are all possible. Mm, I look, I want to show some cases where uh, Xu Jing and I, we, I work in, in the called Poor People for Seven Hectares program. You see, this poor area is not rich area. It's close to Myanmar border. And uh, we created called uh, No People, uh, No uh, Mind Farm for Rice. And uh, this is a different, you know, this opportunity is different. This means agriculture is different. And uh, you see, and not only for farming, but also for processing and to produce, you know, to produce a uh, very market friendly, very attractive, very attractive market friendly rice and the uh, prices increased. So this opportunity never exists in 19, in, in 19th century, in 20, beginning of 20th century in the UK or 1950s in, in, in the Japan. So that exists for many countries like Thailand and many countries even in Africa. So we see the uh, completely different and also for the new economy, for services like what the Herbian village when the James was there for a conference. It's a very poor area. We turn into a conference uh, friendly and uh, you know, for, uh, for leisure and uh, for the trade uh, for the conference. And, uh, and you see this is the village. Uh, you cannot imagine this uh, left behind the lady, young lady. We, we built a very nice village recently, and in the Yunnan, you see uh, this uh, called New Farm. So she is the manager of the coffee shop. And this the in the poor area. Please check with the called the Da Miao Zhe. Mm, da Miao Zhe, any Chinese people come. And uh, we are doing this called Rural CEO. And this is very new that the young people put into the CEO. So we have also the public service, uh, infrastructure development, and the ecological way. So, and, uh, and also rural government. So I'm going to lastly to see development model, thinking from rural development perspective. Sequential model is always the model that dominates all this. And, uh, and there we're going to argue that um, parallel model. Parallel model is possible that rural modernization can be advanced while well, industrialization and urbanization are still ongoing. This is the case. Not to wait until the time we back to the rural area, but we go parallel. Therefore, this no longer as a plan, it's no longer as anything designed by the World Bank, and nothing designed by the World Bank, by the OECD, by the US Agency for International Development, by the DFID, now called for Office for, for the Office for Forest for issue, for Affairs and Development. No. They're not designed this, but they're the local exercise. Let me take this one. They're the exercise in the source, which create another narrative, and I call that narrative to challenge our mainstream understanding of development and also to challenge our theoretical understanding, which all scholarship produced uh, to help developing country. So let us see and how this story, this narrative in China, elsewhere in China, and can actually tell us more about uh, uh, our development study. So, and uh, I stop here and uh, you know, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much.
as always, fascinating, really interesting. And we have uh, a half hour in which we can have some discussion. And this is what LSC is known for, coming challenging speakers. So I expect you, especially my students who are here, but I expect you all to challenge this if you come up with your questions. I mean, one thing that I, I would just want to comment on, and that's that, you know, even in the West, the over the past 20 years, economic historians have reevaluated this sequential story. There was an, a lot of synergy between what happened in the Industrial Revolution and agricultural change, rather than just a, a story of sequence, which I think strengthens your argument, because you can see the roots of this, despite whatever was the kind of generalized picture that was portrayed, that for, for, for um, the kind of accelerated development that occurred over much longer period of time. And historically, there was already an important synergy between the two sectors. So, and the other comment I would just make is that um, this fascinating story about what's happened in China, the one graph that's not there, which is important to keep in mind, is the huge um, advance in land productivity. So when you compare China's productivity of land, um, already that was achieved after land reform and during up to 1978, but then it was accelerated. So there's very highly productive uh, use of the land, comparatively speaking. So, you know, whether you, when you talk about the, the grain so crop still, or- Still overpopulated. Yeah, yeah. So that's Surplus labor in a very big way. We, we have now the Arthur Lewis building over here. Yeah, and, and you know, this, this is what, this is what um, Arthur Lewis, you know, uh, modeled and called for is being able to mobilize productively all this rural labor. But anyway, so this is a, a very interesting story. It poses some very controversial questions. You know, what's happening to, to, to the countryside? Should there be, you know, an agglomeration of land? Or, and 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 the small scale farming obliterated, or is there some uh, medium in between? But I think the big story you're talking about and that you've seen in your villages has to do with the diversification of of, of employment and wealth making, et cetera, in the in the Chinese rural areas, so that you have a flourishing rural area rather than. An, a left behind rural area with only old people and very small children. But anyway, let's take your questions. Yeah, let's we'll start with you. Okay, so thank you. Uh, can you, excuse me, just once. Can you tell me how many people are on Zoom? We have uh, uh, three people at the moment. Okay, if any of you who are there on Zoom want to ask a question, please, um, they can do it in the chat, yeah. right? Um, no, okay, that. okay. You'll be the interlocutor. Yeah. Go ahead, I'm sorry. Hello, thanks for your wonderful, uh, wonderful speech. And I have a question regarding the sustainability of this kind of model. So sometimes it seems to me that uh, uh, we are also using an intent interventionist approach to in, into rural development. So we are like, uh, drawing more investment into it and uh, uh, promoting people to come back to their villages. And, uh, I'm not sure if, like, if economic growth decline, uh, will it be less opportunities uh, for these villages to develop or will it be less focus on uh, rural development? So. My question is mainly regarding. Should we take a couple of questions if there are other ones, or why don't you start with that question while other people are formulating their their, their questions? Huh? Do we have one more? Yeah. Thank you, Li teacher. I'm Li Shan. I'm from As an urbanite, uh, I'm very interested in 
the social cost of losing our rural culture. For one of my papers recently, I interviewed small scale farmers in the UK, um, specifically around uh, the issues contributing to food insecurity. Um, so uh, if you could speak to maybe the social costs, be it inequality and so on, um, as a result of this rural decline. Okay, why don't we start with those two? And they're both kind of about the costs of, okay. the social costs of what's yeah. happening. Uh, I, I think uh, both of you put forward quite interesting question. Uh, first one for the sustainability, right, you're right. You know, there's two conditions. One is that um, uh, <clears throat> with the overall economy, assuming over, overall economy is going down, and uh, there will be another scenario. There will be another scenario we talk about. This means that when globalization is really break, break down, there will be different scenario when the student, how many students will come to the NC to study. So this is another scenario. I'm not going to talk that one, but mm -hmm. second scenario, second issue. Second, secondly, you, when you, with your question, is said sustainability must be based on what I call the, uh, what we have to not, to not to rely on the external investment. And this will not last longer, uh, whether you have a very good economy or not good economy. And this depends on what I call, the, you have to create, um, uh, you have to create a new structure. New structure means it's, it's rooted, embedded, it's rooted in the rural area, it's not something which uh, you make yourself, but but also you have to make the farmer center, what I call the participatory economy. It's very important in the participatory economy and it's more uh, it's, it's more sustainable than the capitalist uh, economy. And uh, the failure of uh, what you talk about in many cases in China is that when the, when the <clears throat> business people they invested, when there's no market they're going. And they left nothing there. So we are not talking, we're not doing this one in China. We mostly we're doing what I call farmer centered, farmer participatory, where farmer then make this, make, make this one. Small, small holders. The small holder makes this one for their livelihood strategy, not for the rational strategy. Of course, they will do something rationally. You know, they're doing something rational, as you're doing rationally, but what's basically you are doing survival. You're doing your survival. This is a very different approach when you please read about these books. So we are trying to and we are trying to we are trying to advocate we call the uh, is, uh, we call the essentially to promote livelihood based approach by using the rational way. Meaning that you go to market, link with market called the rational, but you not you, you are not making completely full money, you know. Complete four money never will be very fragile and very fragile. So this is one very good question. For the for the social value, you're right. Root decline certainly leads to completely disappearing of anything. Which we as the people, we are rooted generation by generation. So we from that from that angle, uh, we need to look at rural development today. Uh, not only from economic angle, but we have to put four angles here economically because if we don't have a new economy, then people will not come back to rural area. Uh, people will leave rural area for urban. Area. So that's first. Uh, secondly, we need we need we need a rural area uh, uh, socially uh, viable. Uh, that attract people coming. So we need to maintain our uh, uh, rural value. And that is second dimension for the year. And the third dimension has, is that the rural area always occupies large area of the territory anywhere, in UK, in China, anywhere. Therefore, rural area serves, serves as, the, as the way for our ecolog ecological values. Rivers, uh, forests, and wood, so, so there. Lastly, very importantly, I would say the rural area serves for a new type of structure politically. 
and we neglected all our political, why our political system today has lots of problems. Because they are rich people based, because they are business people driven, because they are all do dominated by these intellectuals that you mean. So rural is different, they have different politics. And that one is more sustainable for the society. So we have, we're not, I'm not going to back to, I'm not going to talk about this called the rural, ruralist, extreme, fundamental, extreme, fundamental ruralist. But I'm talking very um, modest way uh, to say rural, what I today, rural area, rurality, uh, ruralism, ruralism, new ruralism uh, with these four functions, four dimensions, dimensions. Okay, so. Yes, and then you. Hi, uh, first of all, thank you for today's amazing uh, panel. And my question is regarding the Chinese uh, population regist registration system, Yeah, because it seems like one of the key variables to impact the rural urban issue in China is the Hu Zi Zhi. And uh, it seems that Nowadays, the Chinese Communist Party top leadership is discussing about the flexibility of rele releasing some, like, uh, releasing some flexibility on this issue on the registration system. And when we're talking about people start flu from rural to urban area nowadays, so I'm wondering if there's an or what volatility and shift on registration <coughs> systems will <coughs> impact on today's topic. Okay, so that's one question about the hukou and the, and the 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 obligatory res, um, uh, registration in urban and rural areas, which is changing quite rapidly. And another. Um, very short. So it's about how are these projects being financed, and like who is providing the initial capital for these projects, and what uh, role is playing the state right now. Okay, so the, I'm repeating because you know it, people are listening on Zoom and recording. So, so how is this all being financed? Is the second okay. question. Go ahead. Okay, uh, uh, your question for the for the hukou. Uh, the, for the hukou, I think first uh, this is going to be it has been changed and this is going to continue to be changed. And uh, rural people now do not like to. To, to, to give up rural hukou any longer because they want to hold their land and their property. So that, that is new dynamic. And uh, secondly, that's the real difficulty. It's not for the hukou itself, but it's for the public service provision. And the public service provision means the quality of education. When you move in Beijing, but you cannot access the best schools, your kids, you, can send up, you cannot send your school. You, are, you cannot send your kids to the best school in Beijing. So that prohibit hugely. Otherwise, in the middle city, middle size city, small cities, it's open now. It's open. You can easily do it. So this is a very different scenario situation. But that problem, I, that problem derives from what I was talking about, this distorted rural urban long term process and everything. So this is the problem. This is called problem how we are dealing with this is rural urban transformation. Therefore, we want to have new rural area where we have an equally important, equally important education, equally, impo equally uh, important edu edu for infrastructure, everything. So that is uh, back to your question that they call the national program for rural revitalization. And uh, doing this program, there are various sub programs like number one, to improve rural services program, to improve rural um, rural infrastructure program and the uh, social government. Yeah, toilet revolution program, you see, and uh, account of one house by one household, you won't have a, you won't have a, a toilet. And they're all financed by the state. They all everything financed is the largest state financed the rural development program in the world, and it started early stage by, by the rural by the poverty reduction program, which my personally advice national wide, and continues link to the rural revitalization program. So if today if you go to the rural area like James 
go there quite often to see even last year. It's, it, it is impressive how much money put into the rural area over the last 10 years. So this is by fact. I'm not going to give you any, any assessment whether it's good or the bad, but I'm just take this as to see how much money is spent on this one. So this is the program. So the program I'm working, 37, 35, 37 villages in Yunnan that are listed here and all financed by the state. And not all financed by the provincial government, not by state, but the provincial government. And uh, you cannot imagine how much money we spend. This is the way I did not speak today, that, uh, and the role of the state in linking, in linking that rural urban program. I was recently in Bangkok, and last year I had many times in India, my, you know, my friend country, India, I got a lot of, lot of compar comparisons on this aspect. So this is the area of your life. Yeah. I'm wondering, could, could you, if I can jump in, because I see lots of hands going in. Could you tell us a little bit more about the way in which concerns for the environment are being taken into account in the rural revitalization program? Because obviously we know that agriculture is one of the biggest greenhouse gas emitters. We know that there's big energy requirements in the countryside. And so how, how, is, how is that evolving? And, uh, you see the, uh, mm, I, uh, let me just uh, give you my observation for last uh, 10 years, the political agenda. There are two elements within current political leadership. Uh, one dimension is what I call the helping poor. Important money to help poverty or these people. This is one area. And uh, Xi Jinping and his government made a lot of investment. Second one called green development. And the green development means that this huge program on going to protect the environment. And you can also see uh, uh, rivers, uh, forestry, everything is strictly, very strictly. And uh, Ba Feng, my, my colleague Ba Feng, we both convened the paper. I think the Ba Feng, you, you sent this paper to James to look how the elephant issue in our village. Because of the heavily protected program, you know, an elephant comes, a whole group of elephant comes. So our nature, you know, preserve our nature environment. And this means it's very difficult, you know, it's very difficult to, to uh, to to really uh, uh, develop this uh, fertilizer polluted uh, agriculture any longer. It's difficult. That's why you see the many areas where they have stopped completely this heavily polluted uh, program. They are using a lot of uh, called digital, not digital, smart agriculture, and install all different uh, use, uh, equipment to monitor water and nutrient requirement. Mm -hmm. And those are the new things what I've talked about technology technology improvement is very different before. So this provides a new opportunity for developing country to catch up, not follow, not catch up to, to drop out, drop from previous stage into a new situation, not just to catch up, catch up. You are in the front, I'm always following. No, it's going very differently like this. And even for the African and for other countries, you know. Brazil, I was in Brazil, also I observed it's very similar, very similar situation in other countries, yeah. Yes, one here and then one back there. Okay, thank you Tommy, for your speech. So you mentioned in your speech that the quantization is thought to be uh, duplicated in the developed countries, but uh, many people in the West nowadays are uh, regarding China's engagement in the Africa as neocolonialism. And because as a Chinese student, I'm facing those questions uh, like every day, and I would like to know how would you respond to that? So that's a good question on what to what extent is there neocolonialism in China's relationships and investments in Africa? In the back, so just take two questions. Thank you so much, Professor Li. When I was in China, I ever read your book, which is named by the end of poverty, and I'm really curious about your opinion on the topic of pension system. Uh, let me take an example. If a person uh, who was a farmer, he can only get like around 100 RMB as his pension. But if one person worked for the, the cigarette, the, the state-owned uh, cigarette factory, 
actually he can get over uh, 5,000 or even over 10,000 as his pension. So the gap is really huge. A yeah, really important question about the the uh, low level, low opportunity for 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 livable pension uh, income in the countryside. Um, okay, okay. What? Well, let me take another question because we make sure you get. Then students question uh, because when I study in COHD, I I had a, a lecture by a professor in sociology department. The professor said, uh, even the farmers in China they own very little money every day, but if they invest their money or if they enter the factory, they may have like some problem like unemployment, like they may experience some bankrupt, but mm -hmm. if they only invest their money on their own land, they never like have some issues like bankrupt. So I think it's a following question about the student question. How can we balance this? You were, you were giving you were giving the talk by this populist professor, right? <laughs> Sorry for this. Yeah. Uh, let me just uh, uh, respond to three questions. Yeah. So do you study, do you want to study here? I'm sorry. Yeah, I, What's I, I, I study the political economy of China and Europe. Okay, political economy of China and Europe. So what is that program? Out of the European, European Institute. The European yeah. Institute, yeah. that program. Yeah. Very political program. Yeah. <laughs> Right. Be careful. Be careful. Sorry. Uh, and I think the basically, let me put it this way. Mm. As I said, look, what does means colonization? So you have to, you have to have a very clear definition. And uh, when you're going to invest in, when the Western companies like Siemens, Bosch, uh, J.P. Morgan, they all invest in China. I don't think these people colonize China. I don't think so. It's very different. And when China invests in Africa, and when China invests the railways in Africa, when China invests in Africa, I don't think China colonize Africa. I don't think that is different, very different. So when the people, this is the old topic, it's not a new one. So we had talk, a lot of talk in UK with Jingu, you know, almost 10 years ago, 15 years ago, and also in the school here. So I always try and try to say colonization, near colonization. Uh, is the world created? Is the world created to 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 maintain the colonization? That's what I mean to say. Because colonization is the bad name already. So put you as the bad name, you get the morally, morally, morally blamed. You got really a problem morally. So I would say, I'm not going to say, but we would see another issue to see how the different power, China and Africa, in the, in, in, the, in, in the trade, in the investment process, and how to make this really, really mutual benefit. That would be the right question. The mutual benefit in the sense of how the China could benefit and how the India also can benefit. So that's the question, and then we can discuss. And we can't, we cannot always say to China, oh, we always have Africa. No, no, no. We can always say Africans all benefit from China. No, no, no. This has to be case by case to see how we could we can carry out this kind of a transaction and inter and relationship. But I'm, I would I would suggest you to say, look, if anybody put in this one, I said, okay, put first put your definition. Put definition first, then we discuss. Otherwise, it's difficult. No, this one. And second, for the for the inequality issue of inequality. And inequality, uh, yeah, inequality in the sense of uh, what you describe, uh, the uh, the the warfare difference of the warfare. Of, you know, mm, like what I you know I'm professor. If I retire, my pension. My pension will be the one year salary of the farmers, January average. So this, this is very unequal in many ways. So this is the problem. This problem refers to huge, huge issues we'll talk about today, the rural urban. And because we uh, have created this huge disparity, uh, not only income disparity, but also the social service provision 
and this help this has to be this has to be overcome uh, through the effort I'm talking about I'm talking about today and the five dimensions to invest in rural area. Uh, otherwise difficulty simply increase uh, uh, increase the tension uh, in the rural areas doesn't make doesn't make sense. Secondly, and the rural people and urban people are different. Urban people are employed, and the rural people have their property. You know, they have their land um, and the house, everything property. So they are secured somehow. And this has not been has not been calculated. We don't have this kind of statistic to really present really present the data. That data give you uh, not completely. Uh, uh, right and wrong information, but some information which provide you to understand that, well, this is the situation. So if you look for the EU, you, uh, OECD statistics, and very different. So uh, we have tried, because I advised 10 years ago our national statistics program. So I understand that. You know, we try to learn OECD statistics, try to make comparisons, very different. So don't use data itself from UK, uh, from Germany, from the United States, and from China to make any comparison. It doesn't make any sense because uh, the fundamental calculation is very different, you know, and inclusion of all kinds of ind indicators, parameters also very different. And for even for the rural income and, uh, you know, for the rural productivity, I got a lot of problems with that, you know, it's very difficult. Therefore, I go case by case. I go there to ask how much money and I use this to present student. And the official statistics doesn't make really sense. So you are right. Last your question you added, and I like my my professor. And you talk about the professor. I don't know name. My professor told you that if somebody invests in the urban area, and uh, someday urban area, urban industry bankrupt, and you lose money, and you better stay in the rural area. So ask your professor why you don't let your your son and your daughter stay whole life in the rural area. Ask your question. <laughs> So, yeah. Okay, we have time for just maybe if, if you brief questions and brief answer before we have to wrap it up. So first, first you and then. Uh, thanks a lot for your uh, seminar. Um, about the new structural development, uh, I was wondering about the proposal of supply demand product services challenges. Um, so for example, how to narrow the gap between the new added value products like the rice, Norman farm, as you mentioned, or like the gift rooms. In a context of a low demand market, and I have worked in a lot of development countries, and this is the main issue that we have. And what's your perspective of a public policy to support like a national market, or maybe even an incentivize a global trade um, of actual national examples or academic proposals of this, um, you know, to narrow this um, demand supply? Yeah, another one. Okay, yeah. Uh, my question is short. So do you think um, China's social policy is already having this shifting paradigm towards enabling this sort of participatory model that you were maybe just because there is such thing called that China's new work called offered in contracts? Do you think that's kind of already enabling this? So it's the question about social policy and yeah. Uh, very good. So why don't you take those two and I think Okay, one last question, briefly. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. And uh, uh, I have a question, like, uh, I don't know what the stat of uh, the China has, like, uh, the average form holding, uh, 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 like, land holding of a former has in China. So, if that is uh, very small, so what uh, what the government is doing for the stakes of the, uh, uh, to be more inclusive, to include the uh, small farmers into the, uh, into the transformation of the rural, uh, rural development program, and uh, in in continuation with that, I I want to hear from you that uh, the digital unmanned collective farming. So your thoughts on that, and how is that going to be beneficial to the society, or it it adds more complexity to the uh, to the rural transformation program? Okay, so this is a question about smallholders and what prospects there are. You have five mi four minutes to wrap yeah, up. I think, I think, uh, very quickly for the. Yeah. Uh, I think there are two levels of issues. You're right. You know, uh, what I was talking about rural development and I emphasize the importance of the rural development itself does not mean that we should ignore, we shouldn't ignore, we should ignore 
or we should really, really put down the urbanization and the industrialization. That is what I'm trying to say. This should be integrated, not separated. Therefore, and uh, the transformation still requires a proper level of industrialization and urbanization. And without that one, economically it's not possible. Economically it's not possible. Uh, therefore, somehow the capitalist itself still works in that aspect. And the second level, this means second level, we do need to consider. We do need to consider at the global level. For many, many developing countries, and uh, they cannot wait for their urban area and the industrial sector grows to the level that to provide drive for the urban rural area. So therefore, we need another level of, uh, we need to look for the, uh, for, for the global uh, globalization aspect. So therefore, you know, I would say, uh, I would say that. Um, and the social policy, and uh, I personally do not consider we have systematic way of shift uh, from this to that, but you can see the tendency. Politically, you can see the tendency and the uh, people-centered program, uh, we emphasize very differently uh, from before. Uh, we are, I'm not going to say we're moving uh, from past, of, but we are, we are somehow moving into the area where uh, uh, away from this cooperative mm -hmm. politics in the, from, uh, from the before. And lastly, uh, for the land issue for smallholder, you're right, so we have called 2D, Liu Zhuang. We have a kind of land mobility program. Uh, allows you to rent your land to him and, and if you don't like, but you cannot sell. You cannot sell means that you have your property for your life uh, unless you cannot make your living in the urban area. You come back to the rural area, you can still live. So that is the basic, basic social security for the small farmers, but at least to increase, in order to increase, improve small farmers' productivity and efficiency, and the cooperative is organized that you are the member of cooperative and you can access uh, market uh, by having a large scale of operation as we did this one, uh, that, that land still belongs to you. So this is the arrangement for this, yeah. I Sorry. think that we were really privileged to have the chance of of Professor Lee passing through London, coming back to the LSC. So we should all all thank him for such an enlightened. Thank you.